So this is, just so you know, this is uh, the final session. This is the industry panel, uh, the future of work perspectives. Um, let me introduce from the other end, Mr. Bill Beamant, who's Northern Stars Resources founder, uh, Mr. Riley Finlayson, WA School of Mines chairman. And uh, next to him is Mr. Michael Zolotov from Razor Labs. He's the chief tech officer. Uh, Amanda Miles is the Director of Client Services and Company Director with Risk Management Technologies. Uh, Liz Dallamore is uh, WA Data Science Lab at Curtin University Hub, I should say, not lab. And Jackie Car Connolly is a Vice President for People and Global Capability at Woodside. So that was the order, working that way down. Um, and I'm going to start straight away getting into the conversation. I want to ask about, obviously, this is the, the end game for a lot of the students, how your organization engages with schools and young people. Um, Bill, what, what do you do? Do you, How do you actively get out there? Um, look, we probably do a lot more at the, I guess, the university level um, and, and also the trades. So we do get in the schools in the back end because we, we uh, I think only 10% of our workforce is actually technical disciplines like mining engineers, geos, metallurgists. The other 90% are either blue collar workers that already got a trade certificate like an electrician or a um, or a um, mechanic or something like that. So we spend a bit of time in the in the high schools, um, and predominantly a lot to do with the tertiary institutions like the School of Mines um, with Curtin and, and also UWA. When you say spend some time in the schools, what what, what are you doing? Wh who are you talking to? Um, we try and talk to the, I guess to the students. Okay. Um, this is number one. Um, that's I guess our captive audience. Um, we probably don't do enough of in the junior school levels, but I think. Um, industry recognises that, and uh, and our representative bodies like Chamber of Minerals and Energy and and Curtin all that on that side are going to try and drill down to more of the junior. I think one of the biggest issues we've got is primary school kids and, and understanding in mm. teachers, get them to understand the importance of mining. You don't, you don't have an iPhone um, without mining, and we mine all the commodities in this state that go into your phone and into your cars and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, what 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 sort of things do they say to you? Yeah, you know, what, what are they curious about? Um, I think. Just first thing is perception of mining um, is sort of skewed with to what actually actually happens out there and what's reality. Um, you know, mining probably 30, 40, 50 years ago probably deserved its reputation, but it's a lot different now. Right, okay. Are they still working off that old vision in many ways? I think a lot of people are, yes. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Uh, Riley, what do you do? How, how do you get amongst the, the kids in the schools and listen yeah. to what they're saying? Yeah, I think one of the initiatives we've done recently with the um, West Australian School of Mines um, with Curtin University is we're running uh, mining camps or resources camps and companies like Northern Star and, and Saracen and, and BHPs run these camps where we're getting students coming through. Um, to date, it's been first-year engineering students from, from say, um, Curtin University in Bentley coming into Kalgoorlie. Um, we're going to dub that, that into, into the schools as well to enable the kids to come out to the sites and actually see what a career in resources would look like. Um, the other thing we did this year during May is taking uh, a bunch of teachers, uh, probably had five or six teachers coming from various schools like um, Willerton, um, Guilford Grammar, and again, take them down into the mines. We actually took them into one of Bill's mines just out of Kalgoorlie, and it was amazing to be able to show them some of the technology and remote mm. control technology that was happening, which was a, a different perception to what mm. they saw. So yeah. Does if, it make um, them more keen once they've actually been on site? I think more came, but also a greater awareness of what mm. maybe what they had perceived versus what was reality, and also some of the uh, movements around ESG that the whole industry is making, which is very positive. So I think um, if anyone in the room is interested in doing that, we're more than happy to accommodate that because it's a really good eye opener to to see what a career in mining actually looks like. Mm, it's great, Michael. International company, obviously you you've got interest all around the world. But tell me how how, how you engage with some of the schools here. What do you do? do you, how do you listen to what the schools here are offering? Well, uh, actually, I'm pretty different from uh, my colleagues here. Um, what we do basically is deploy AI and deep learning solutions. So obviously, we're looking more for engineering uh, workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a few collaborations. We started, we're based in Israel, started uh, our branch here uh, roughly two years ago. Um, our collaboration started in the Israeli universities, obviously. We're now doing the same thing here. Basically, basically what we're doing is we're taking elite engineers, mainly uh, computer science and electrical engineering uh, graduates, and we're putting them through a two-month course to become deep learning practitioners. So that's what we, uh, that's what we started doing in, the, in Israel. That's what we intend to do also here. In okay, the so it's dealing at a slightly older, they're slightly older. Uh, do you have interest in, in getting amongst the schools and, and, and finding out, you know, 
where the future might be for them? For sure, I can tell you that I, we have bright kids working in Reza Labs that are 18, 19 really? years old. Yeah. Okay. Even so without a degree, just taught themselves how to build these kinds of solutions. Yeah. That, that's amazing. Uh, Amanda, what about you? Yeah, so we're probably a little bit more like Michael in that respect. We're a software provider. And um, so we, through our product, uh, Chemalert, we've actually, there's over 1,200 schools um, throughout WA who have access to the Chemalert product. And what that enables them to do is to look up where there's got chemicals on their, on their schools, is to look up the chemicals, look at the identification information about those products and also look for alternatives. Um, and that's one of the big things that we're trying to push now and especially in the schools and in the current environment is, is looking at the, the products and chemicals that are out there and that are being used and finding safer alternatives. And I've, you know, I've noticed down on the floor today, down at um, being on the booth, the kids these days have so much awareness of what impacts is you know these things have to the environment mm. and mm. how they can make it better and and even the impacts to themselves just using your everyday cleaners and things like that so while we then have other clients that use it for different purposes for kids it's all about you know making a difference how can you tap into that rich source that they are offering up yeah i i think it's i mean i think it's quite difficult but um just listening to some of those conversations we also take in um a quite a big number of graduates that come out of uni, um, particularly in the dev uh, development teams and our scientific teams, mm. um, who who are aware of you know those those everyday issues, and then you know they make they help us adapt as well as a company. Super, Liz, thank you. So, I'm slightly different in that I'm not a company, but I run the WA Data Science Innovation Hub, which is a state government initiative. And a big part of that work is to look at how we can get high school kids to engage better with data analytics and data science. So um, the hub is reasonably new, but we are sort of charged with helping to implement the state government's new STEM strategy. And part of that is getting into schools and looking at problem-based learning. So rather than having your silos of maths, chemistry, physics, we're actually looking at how can we how can we work with a problem and we generally go for an industry-based problem and that has come from the resources sector. And we get kids to think about how they can actually combine their skill sets across, so not just STEM but STEAM as well, so bringing in that creat creativity from the arts sector. To, to bring all that together with a sort of thread of data analytics, um, there's some coding in there, to really come up with, with cool solutions. We've got some IoT in there, so Internet of Things, um, so looking at sensor technologies, pulling the data out of that using data analytics, but to come up with really creative solutions. And the problems that we give them are industry-based problems because when these kids go into the real world, it's not like school, it's not like uni, right? You're working in a team and you're working on problems and you're going to have to draw on your knowledge from a whole raft of subjects. So they're the types of programs that we're looking into piloting into high schools across WA, so in the regions and in the metro area. Super. Thank you, Liz. And finally, Jackie. Last but not least, thank you. But um, firstly, before I kick off, I want to say a huge thank you to all the teachers and those in the education area. Um, it's all the work you do that goes often unthanked um, to say thank you because we get the benefits of them when they join the workforce. So keep up the good work. Personal thanks there. Um, how Woodside engages is that at a variety of levels. So we do a little bit in the early education, um, really knowing that that's when kids are starting to think about subjects and understanding um, STEM. So we do a little bit of support and education and myth busting that you referred to of what is resources, um, particularly for us in the energy space. Woodside then also strategically partners with several community groups. And we do this for the reason of really wanting to target groups that we want to create a different opportunity for those kids, particularly Indigenous, those that are less privileged. Um, and we do a variety of scholarships, apprenticeships um, and support um, even before they get through school. And that's both at the secondary and also the tertiary level um, for our organisation. And some of those partnerships have been in place for many, many years and we look to continue that um, because the benefit um, for us is seeing ongoing sustainable mm. employment later on. Super, thank you. Um, let, let's just broaden it now in terms of you know, what you're looking for, the, the skills, the key skills, the capabilities. You, you sort of alluded to that, Liz, with regards to sort of more problem solving. But Bill, what do you, you, you talked about university and finding 
for talent at university level, but what, what do you think schools could be honing in particular for, so, that, so that they're really relevant for the workforce? Oh, look, there's plenty documented about that, but I, I think key number one is we've just got to educate people from a resource sector in the education, like I said earlier on. Um, we've got to start in the, in the primary school years. Um, it's too late when you go into the years nines and tens and, you know, they're already career and, you know, making it. And I've got a year nine year uh, girl at the moment and, um, you know, they've, they're headstrong and they've got their own opinion in life and where things go. So I think you've got to get a little bit earlier to break some of that myth busting, like you say. Um, but you can't emphasise the STEM component. That is super, super important for our game. Um, is getting kids involved in those STEM subjects. And that is one of our biggest challenges, is to get people into that. And, you know, people that do go into STEM, if you look at their career prospects when they get into university and into the workforce, um, they're exponential compared to some of the, you know, old things. And, and we know that the jobs of the future, well, we don't know the jobs of the future, hmm. um, but it's going to be radically different from today. But the STEM gives everyone that really, really good footprint and baseline to, to readjust their careers in the future. Without STEM, would you still employ? Oh, look, as I said, a, a lot of my workforce are blue-collar workers. Mm. So, you know, I want people that, that go out and do trades. You know, some of the best, most fulfilling jobs and highest-paid jobs in this state are tradespeople. Um, and I don't think we actually endorse that or promote it enough. You know, not everyone needs an education at university. Um, my dad was a mechanic by trade and he did very well in life. So I mm. think this state affords those opportunities for kids to leave school and go into the trades. Yeah. Riley, when Bill was talking about primary school being a good starting point, do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I do. I, do. I, I think um, if I just take a step back, um, I suppose the, the, the title, so Resources Technology Showcase, I suppose if I had my way, I'd like to call it Resources Showcase. Um, I suppose the only, only fear I've got of having 5,000 students going downstairs and seeing all the technology in the industry um, the, the, the resources sector, mining and energy, is broader than that. And I think to Bill's point, one of the concerns I've often had, um, you know, BHP, Rio, um, CME, MCA, will be often showing um, ads around technology, drones, AI, data analytics, um, and it all is coming. But also, by the same token, what we are seeing is a significant drop-off in trades, for example, as Bill mentioned. So I think we've got to be mindful that at the moment, we still need trades in to our mine sites to be able to make sure that we're fixing equipment and we, and we may be 24 or 30 years away from actually having AI to completely take that uh, take that away. So I think mm -hmm. we've got to be really careful. I think it's probably not by accident that we're actually seeing a drop off in those trades. I think we've got to be really mindful that technology is evolving and it has a massive place in it. And by default, students, we find that balance because it's not all about robotics and you go into the industry and it's just drones sure. flying around. There's a whole bunch of fundamentals that still exist. Sure. Uh, Michael, how, how, how do you think we're going here, given the fact that you're an Israeli company, how do you think we're doing here in WA? You know, you, you can observe, you can see what's coming out of schools and university. How would you sum it up? Um, I, I can say from my perspective, I mean, as I said, we're focused on machine learning and uh, deep learning AI and such. And this field is fo progressing so quickly that even if you're up to date today, you're out of date tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking for are basically two things. First is um, having a really good mathematical intuition. Doesn't matter if you took it from engineering or took it from uh, uh, mathematics or any other STEM uh, or any other science. Um, and the second thing is being able to learn by yourself. Mm -hmm. Because eventually there's a limit to what a school and university or even an industry can teach you. And being up to date basically will only happen if you're going to read materials uh, yourself, if you're going to be interested in the field and if you're going to progress yourself. So that's what we're looking Israel for. Israel has a good reputation sort of leading the way in many ways uh, in this space. What, what, what have they done so well that you know, maybe we could learn from? Um, basically, I think that one of the differentiation factors or one of the reasons for it is that um, in Israel, as, as you know, there's a mandatory service. You've got to go through the military, and the Israeli military is super technological. So from really, really early age, 17 or 18, when you're enlisted to the military, you deploy solutions which are commercialized. I mean, if you don't deploy any something, it, it doesn't matter what you did. So being able to deploy tech in Russian environments, in, in deserts, or satellites, or radars, or whatever, it teaches people to, do, to be super uh, practical, where commercialization is the key. So, uh, and super independent, which is uh, connected to my previous uh, 
Thank you. Uh, Amanda. Yeah, so we, um, I guess being the, the company that we are as well, we um, we need people when, when they come out of uni and they come in to us as graduates to, to start thinking outside the box. What we find is um, they might come to us with great skills, they're developers or, um, you know, and they want to work on the latest technology. They want to do the latest things. Um, there's no more of this, you know, start at the ground and work your way up. They want to come in and they want to play with the fancy tools and, and do that kind of thing. But it's the ability to actually be agile and to move where we need to move as a company. Being a fairly small company, you know, we, we do have that ability to be quite dynamic. Yeah. And so it's, it's even though the universities are, are teaching a syllabus and, and providing that education, we still need them to come out and be creative, to think outside the box and, and to be fluid so that we as a company can still grow and mm. evolve as we need to. I, I would imagine you're going to say exactly that. <laughs> Has the other panel outbid us? <laughs> yeah. Thanks for your input anyway. I'll send the others up in a minute. <laughs> Bill's birthday today. Oh, happy, happy birthday, birthday, Bill. <laughs> Very good. Um, sorry. Yeah, no, I think... Um, so I, I guess we're the, at the hub we're, we're very much focused around jobs of the future. So what are the jobs of the future and where, the, where is the gap? And there is a massive... Um, need for people that have data analytics skills but a big part of that is also having the softer skills so you might be a great technical person but if you can't in the workforce go and speak to a colleague and really be able to understand where they're coming from and have some of those softer communication skills um, then then it's going to be a real challenge um, the other thing that I think STEM does well is it's really that sort of passion for understanding how things work and the passion for learning that, um, that we really want to see our kids yeah. develop, essentially. Yeah. Super. Okay. Oh, look, um, all of the above. But I think um, the interesting thing with students and how we can leverage them at all levels is that diversity of thought. Mm -hmm. Creating organisations with everyone that operate the same way doesn't bring about that that brilliant one in a million, the unicorn idea. So, so does um, that mean that too much STEM thinking is? No, it's it's. I, no, I don't think it's too much, but I think it's missing out on everything. Okay. Uh, truly amazing teams that we see in our place of work um, do bring innovation of thought. Do bring um, as I was demonstrating outside before the person that looks at the problem and thinks of it through a different lens. So. I see that energy in every human being and an opportunity not just for teachers but us in the place of work is to find that spark and that energy and make sure that they play well in teams. Um, Organisations that we all have, we all operate a lot better when people play well by the rules. Yeah. We respect each other but we then leverage and learn and grow and the workforce of the future that we see is exactly what um, was said here before about that agility mindset the interest in STEM and STEAM subjects helps, um, but it's also that ability to be f uh, comfortable with change. Um, that's what we all do and we do really well and sometimes I think we create a level of fear around change. So we need the workforces that embrace it, get energy, get excited about something different and bring their lens to the table to create the magic in organisations. And It's going to be a really new opportunity for people coming out of school and university. I think the, my view of the new opportunities out of school and universities, et cetera, is the technical disciplines and interests that you have today are relevant, but bring it with a, a learning or can-do mindset to learn more. Um, the roles that we see today won't exist in the future. My, my role didn't exist when I entered the workforce. It was very, very different structure. Mm. So it's building on what you're learning and being comfortable that you're not going to know what everything is next month but you're going to have a great time learning, growing, challenging, working well with teams, um, and that interest in technology and STEAM and mathematics absolutely helps. Um, but ultimately, it really comes down to respect. Don't, don't lose that at any yeah. time. That okay. certainly helps in organisations. Liz, what's emerging for you, do you think? Um, I think, so obviously, if, if upstairs everyone's talking about data, data is the new oil, so having an appreciation of how data can be used. Um, I don't think you, you need to have a really deep maths understanding to still be able to leverage 
analytics, um, but a, an understanding of, of what that actually means is important. Um, I, I think people don't have jobs for life anymore, right? So the, the one thing that I encourage my own kids, you know, kids that I, I go and talk at schools at is that just have a real passion for learning. Things have changed so much. You can get online and you can learn anything, right? So, you you know, you, you can teach yourself coding online. You, you don't actually need to go anywhere to do it. And universities are, are trying to adapt to that as well. People don't want to go and do whole degrees anymore. They want to micro-credentialise. They want to enter the workforce and do little bits of picking and choosing. So, um, I think if we can always encourage our, our kids to have a real passion for learning, for how to understand things and to know that technology is changing so rapidly and it's okay to, you know, to be a little bit apprehensive that, of that and it's okay to not know everything. That's good. So good advice. Yeah. Thank you. Amanda. Um, yeah, everything that Jackie and Liz have said really um, and I think especially just touching on something that Jackie said is re in regards to that human factor is that we everything is so data driven at the moment and we are all so connected to our phones and we all text a different way than we actually write and especially for the team that you know that I lead you know we're very client focused and and I think that's an element that does get overlooked these days is it's still it's that professionalism it's that courtesy it's the manners that used to you know that used to exist that have now slowly they go out the door when you talk to young kids these days. It's just that human element that we still need to be able to communicate with each other. We still need to be able to um, build relationships and um, just have that human element to to our education and to, to the workforce, really. That's good. That's good job there's still some space for humans in all of this mix. Uh, Michael. Yeah, I'll be brief. I really loved what you said about the passion for learning. Yeah. I think that's the key. Um, our goal, at least in Reza Labs, is to build machines that will make both this industry and in general the more uh, the world a safer place and more efficient. And passion for learning that gets incorporated. I think it's quite scary. So that's you know when you look at you know a resistance to change. You know change is uncomfortable. I talk about that in my business all the time. But the kids coming in school now and coming out in the workforce, they're about to probably get the worst change that, that the history of mankind seen in the next 10, 15 years with how we integrate that. So. The ability for kids to be able to adopt and change and change careers, you know, we're, gonna, we're ne never going to see that change like we're going to see in the next 10, 15 years. So we need to make sure kids are ready for that because it is uncomfortable. Great. Okay, really interesting advice from all five of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are finishing bang on the dot of 3.15 because uh, that's the way it is. And I appreciate the fact that we managed to get through so much in such a short time. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we're now closing on, on we're now closing the shop. So uh, I hope you've all enjoyed it. Thank you very much for being here and enjoy.